Good evening, Section Z. Tonight we're going to look at the topic of regulatory takings, which will actually occupy a fair amount of the remainder of the book. Uh, take a look in the Duke Meteor text at page 623. And the authors here give us the facts of a case from the Supreme Court called Miller. They say, suppose the legislature enacts a statute requiring the destruction of all specimens of a particular species of tree, uh, of trees that are or might become infected with a certain infectious disease, and any such tree located within a certain radius of an apple orchard. The ostensible purpose of the statute is to prevent a public nuisance. A landowner with over 200 of these trees must cut them down, as a consequence of which the value of his land has declined very substantially. Has there been a taking for which compensation must be paid? So in the actual case, it was uh, cedar trees that could develop a fungus which would be harmful to apples. Uh, and so the court uh, had to decide, was this regulation requiring you to cut down the cedar trees in order to save the apple trees um, a taking of property? The court decided that the order to cut down the cedar trees was a valid exercise of the police power. This was within the regulatory power of the state and uh, did not need to be viewed as an exercise of eminent domain. Now, the next case in the book, Pennsylvania Coal Company versus Mahone, is perhaps the most famous uh, regulatory taking case, or at least the, the case that everybody points back to as the fountainhead of the doctrine. The plaintiffs owned some rights in some land in Pennsylvania that they had acquired from the defendant coal company. Um, so the coal company had sold the surface of the land to the plaintiffs, but had retained the right to remove all of the coal underneath the surface. And there was an agreement between the parties about um, the effects of mining on the surface. The parties agreed that the coal company had the right to remove the coal and that the risk was on the plaintiffs. Um, at the, the risk waived all damage claims that might arise from the mining by the coal company under the surface. Um, but the plaintiffs now don't think they are bound by that agreement uh, because of a statute passed in Pennsylvania called the Kohler Act. And the Kohler Act forbids mining that will cause subsidence of a structure used for human habitation uh, on the surface of the land. They claim that they are protected from the mining operations by the Kohler Act. Um, so, the court is thinking about the effect of the statute, and they say on page 625 that the statute is admitted to destroy previously existing rights of property and contract. In other words, the coal company had certain property rights, it had certain contract rights from the agreement with the plaintiffs, and these were uh, eliminated by the passage of the Kohler Act. So the court, the court has to decide, did the Pennsylvania Kohler Act amount to a taking of property of the coal companies requiring just compensation? And the court decided, yes, it did. That this is an act that cannot be enforced without compensating the coal companies whose mineral rights have been destroyed or impaired. Um, so think about the case for a moment. The state of Pennsylvania here has not purported to transfer any rights in property from the coal company to itself. It is not now the fee, fee simple owner of the mineral rights that were previously owned by the coal company. And so in what sense could you view the state's action here as a taking of property? Um, the court decides that though they have not legally asserted ownership of the property, the government has effectively regulated the property to such an extent uh, and diminished its value so greatly that it's as if they've taken it. Um, so one question we can ask is, does it make sense to draw an analogy between regulation of property and taking a property? Isn't there a kind of a difference in kind between telling people what they can do with property they own or taking their property so that you now own it. 
but the court decides that um, at least in extreme cases that distinction should not matter. Um, you know, perhaps they're concerned that if you didn't regulate, uh, didn't recognize regulation as sometimes amounting to a taking, um, that the government would uh, regulate in a way that destroyed all the value of property without compensation. Um, you know, what would stop them from just telling certain landowners, sorry, you can't use your property. Uh, that's not permitted. Um, and if you said that a taking of property requires compensation, but no regulation of property, however severe, requires compensation, you can imagine legislators spending a lot of time trying to figure out ways to regulate property so that the landowners would have to accomplish government objectives more cheaply than if the government had to accomplish them on its own. Um, so, some regulations, the court suggests, will amount to a taking of property. Does that mean that every regulation that diminishes the value of property should be viewed as a taking? And here, the court is very clear that the answer to that is also no. Um, they address that over on page 625, and they say here, near the top of the page, Government could hardly could go on if, to some extent, values incident to property could not be diminished without paying for every such change in the general law. So they think that would be too strict of a straitjacket to place on government if everything that they did to change the law that had an effect on property values amounted to a taking, then the government just couldn't do its work. Um, of course, you could say that you know maybe we should view any pro property uh, any any regulation that that takes away some of the uh, the property owner's rights in the property should be viewed as a taking at least of those rights um, you know if we think of property as a bundle of rights um, any regulation that makes it harder to use the property or diminishes what you can do with it could be viewed as taking one or more sticks out of that bundle. Um, but the court says that's not required. And they explain in the same paragraph, they say, as long recognized, some values are enjoyed under an implied limitation and must yield to the police power. So the idea is that ownership of property is not an absolute ownership, um, that when you own property, there is this implied qualification of your rights that says that there is a reasonable power of the government to regulate your use of that property for the health, safety, welfare, or morals. And if the government exercises that power, they have not uh, taken away something from you that they have just exercised a power that was already implicitly uh, recognized in your ownership of property. Um, and so how do we decide when a regulatory action will be deemed a taking that requires compensation and which ones won't? Um, so the court kind of gets to its test over on page 627. And here's what they say. The general rule, at least, is that while property may be regulated to a certain extent, if regulation goes too far, it will be recognized as a taking, which is, um, you know, maybe uh, overly generous to call it even a general rule. It's not, it, to say that the test is you can't go too far is not really much of a test at all. But uh, one of the great mysteries of constitutional law has been uh, when does a regulation go too far and therefore amount to a taking of property rather than a mere exercise of the police power uh, that qualifies all property rights. Um, so the court does give us a little bit of guidance. Um, it distinguishes uh, a case back on page 625, and I think it can be helpful for us to look at what they say in distinguishing it. The case is Plymouth Coal Company versus Pennsylvania. Um, and there the court says it is true that in Plymouth, it was held competent for the legislature to require a pillar of coal to be left along the line of adjoining property that with the pillar on the other side of the line would be a barrier sufficient for the safety of the employees of either mine in case the other should be abandoned and allowed to fill with water. 
but that was a requirement for the safety of employees invited into the mine and secured an average reciprocity of advantage that has been recognized as a justification of various laws. Um, so let's try and picture what is going on in the Plymouth case. So in Plymouth, we've got a situation where you have uh, you know, the surface of the ground, you've got uh, two neighboring coal companies, uh, company A and company B, we'll call them, and each one is subject to a regulation that it cannot take out all of the coal that it has the right to mind, mine. It has to leave a pillar of coal in place um, with the idea that the pillar of coal left by this company plus the pillar of coal left by this company will serve a protective function. Um, and so basically what it will do is it will make sure that if one of the mines fills up with water, um, that the water does not kind of break through into the other mine and endanger the miners working in the neighboring mine. Um, and so the court says in Plymouth, we recognize the validity of this regulation, even though the regulation required a coal company to leave some of its coal in the ground, not to mine all of the coal it had a right to mine, it was still not a taking of their property that required just compensation. Um, and it, what's interesting is to look at the court's explanation of why that is the case. Um, they say, that was a requirement for the safety of employees invited into the mine and secured an average reciprocity of advantage that has been recognized as a justification of various laws. And so the idea here is that because there was an average reciprocity of advantage from the regulation, it was not a taking. Um, and so what does that mean? Um, well, if we go back to our diagram here, um, that each of the coal companies has a burden under this regulation. Each one is required to leave some coal in the ground that it would have otherwise liked to take out and sell. Um, and so each one is burdened by the regulation, but each coal company is also benefited by the regulation because other coal companies have to comply with it. And so if I'm company B, yes, I'm burdened by the requirement that I leave this coal in the ground, but I'm benefited by the requirement that company A leave its coal here, a pillar of coal in the ground, because it protects my employees from being injured. Um, and so this regulation both burdens me and benefits me by its application to others. And that average reciprocity of advantage is a reason that we're not going to deem it to be a taking of property. Um, so that is one principle that the court gives us in trying to think through when will a regulation be a taking. If there's an average reciprocity of advantage from the regulation, then less likely that you're going to find that it's gone too far and it's a taking of property rights. Um, now, with respect to the private landowners uh, who are the plaintiffs here, the court thinks that the Kohler Act has gone too far and amounts to a taking. Um, they give some explanation of that. On uh, 625, they say, if we were called upon to deal with a plaintiff's position alone, we should think it clear that the statute does not disclose a public interest sufficient to warrant so extensive a destruction of the defendant's constitutionally protected rights. Um, and so they're taking into account the extent to which the defendant's uh, rights in property and contract were destroyed. Um, and they also potentially seem to be looking at uh, the extent to which 
they, uh, there is a public interest uh, advanced by the regulation. Um, here, the public interest is low. This was damage to a private house, not to the public generally. Um, and while the public might have an interest in keeping people safe, that interest could be advanced without this regulation simply by giving people notice when you're going to be mining under the surface of the land. Um, so the test that the court applies is sometimes called the diminution in value test, um, but it could even be viewed as maybe some species of balancing test where they are weighing the degree of the diminution in value um, and the, the extent to which uh, the public interest is impacted or, or advanced by the regulation. Um, now, another case that the court talks about uh, on page 627 is the case of Bowditch versus Boston. In the Bowditch case, there was a fire and the government blew up a house in an effort to keep the fire uh, contained, to keep it from spreading to other buildings. Um, so if you think about it, blowing up a house would seem to be an, a, an act that kind of goes pretty far in preventing people from using their property. Um, and yet this was deemed not to be a taking of property, um, even though it had completely eliminated the value of the property, perhaps. It, it certainly greatly diminished it. Um, and so the court in explaining uh, that case says that it was <clears throat> an exceptional case, like the blowing up a house to stop a con conflagration. Um, and they said that, um, you know, it, it may be doubted if uh, it goes beyond the general rule uh, and whether the, uh, whether they do not stand as much upon tradition as upon principle. Um, if we were gonna think of a principle to explain that case, one that you might focus on is that um, when there is an emergency and public officials are having to act to address the emergency, we don't want them to be wavering in decisive action because they're worrying about the fear of being sued for a taking. And so maybe, um, we don't hold the government liable because this is just a situation that demands that they act quickly without having to weigh potential liability as one of the consequences. Um, another case that might be said to apply the same principle is a case out of World War II, United States versus Caltex. Um, this was from when the United States forces were withdrawing from the Philippines. Um, and as they were leaving, they blew up some property belonging to an American oil company because they didn't want it to fall into the hands of uh, the enemy forces. Um, and the court in that case decided that blowing up the oil company's property to prevent it from, from being used against the US military by, uh, by the enemy was not a taking of property. Um, now, that's Justice Holmes' majority opinion in Pennsylvania Coal versus Mahone. The dissenting uh, position, uh, position is advanced by Justice Brandeis. Um, he takes the view that the Kohler Act was a valid application of the police power. Um, he analogizes it to nuisance cases. Uh, this is not a taking. It's rather a regulation that's designed to protect public health, safety, welfare, or morals. Um, he says that the restriction in question is merely the prohibition of a noxious use, right? So a use of the property that was harmful to neighbors. Um, on page 628, he responds to the diminution in value test that you find in the majority opinion. Um, let's see. Here we go. Um, it is said that one fact for consideration in determining whether the limits of the police power have been exceeded is the extent of the resulting diminution in value, and that here the restriction destroys existing rights of property and contract. But, Justice Brandeis argues, values are relative. If we are to consider the value of the coal kept in place by the restriction, we should compare it with the value of all other parts of the land. That is with the value not of the coal alone, 
but with the value of the whole property. The rights of an owner, as against the public, are not increased by dividing the interests in his property into surface and subsoil. Okay, um, and so what is the point that he is making? Well, this is the issue that the authors address in note three after the case, the issue called conceptual severance. Um, and so the question that is being addressed in this part of the opinion is, <clears throat> when you're trying to decide whether a regulation of property has gone too far um, and has done too much to diminish the value of property, um, exactly what property do you focus on? Do you look at an entire tract of land uh, when only a portion of it is being regulated? Or can you separate out particular sticks in the bundle, particular property rights, and look at the effect of regulation on those property rights in particular? Um, and so in the Kohler, or in the, the uh, Mahone case, the majority arguably seems to be focusing on the effect of the Kohler Act on the subsurface rights, the rights owned by the coal company, the right to take coal out of the ground and uh, to do it without worrying about uh, the support of the surface. Brandeis says that you can't treat the surface, the subsurface and the air above it um, as distinct. You have to view them all as part of the same whole. So it's all one piece of property. And in thinking about the effect of the, the regulation, you have to look at the uh, effect on all rights in the property, not just one subset of those rights. Um, the the, the uh, conceptual severance issue is sometimes called the denominator problem. And so let me pull up our whiteboard again to kind of uh, explain what that means. Um, so any regulation, I guess, you could view as a fraction in terms of its effect on property rights. Um, and so the numerator of the fraction um, is whatever part of the property rights that are taken or destroyed by the regulation. Um, the, denominator of the fraction is the whole. Um, but the debate that's going on between Brandeis and the majority is, what is this denominator? What is the whole against which we measure diminution in value? Do we look at all rights in the land, as Brandeis argues, or do we look at some subset of those rights, like the right to mine the coal or the right, uh, the su support estate, which uh, had been purchased, I guess, by the coal company in this case. Um, page 632 in the book, uh, the authors have another case from Pennsylvania that is after the Mahone case um, called Keystone. Here we go. Keystone Bituminous Coal Association versus De Benedictus, a 1987 case dealing with a later statute um, that was adopted in Pennsylvania. And this statute, uh, called the Subsidence Act, required mine operators to keep up to 50% of their coal in place and to repair subsidence damage, even if surface owners had waived their rights. So it seems to be doing kind of some of the same things that the Kohler Act was doing. Uh, and so the court again is being asked, does this regulation of coal companies amount to a taking of property? This time the court decides that it does not. Um, and so it has to distinguish Pennsylvania coal, uh, figure out, it has to explain why this case is not uh, taking when that one was. The court says that the statute in the Pennsylvania coal case was aimed at protecting the balancing uh, and uh, protecting the interests of private landowners. This one is aimed at protecting the public interest in health, environmental quality, and fiscal integrity. 
Um, you know, that's, uh, you can think about whether that distinction works or not. Um, you know, that certainly was part of the focus in Pennsylvania coal, that there wasn't a great deal of public interest in that one house. Um, but, you know, when you look at lots of houses together, maybe there is, and maybe that's the, exactly the same interest that's at issue in the Keystone uh, Bituminous Coal Association case. Um, and with respect to this conceptual severance issue, uh, the court seems to side with Brandeis right? Um, they say that our takings jurisprudence forecloses reliance on legalistic distinctions within a bum bundle of, right, uh, of rights. Um, the coal companies hadn't shown sufficient diminution in value. The millions of tons that they left in place under the Pennsylvania statute were not a separate segment of property, but only a low percent of the total coal owned by the companies. And so it seems like by that point, Brandeis has the upper hand on how to address this issue of conceptual separance. Um, it's a good stopping point. We will talk about another important uh, regulatory taking case in our next lecture.